Well, it's really exciting time for us as a church because this is going to be our last Sabbath here at 442 Tom Street. So if there is anyone listening on and just wanted to let you know that this is going to be our last Sabbath at this location, 442 Tom Street, and we are moving to 55 Rowan Ave or Avenue. 55 Rowan Avenue, starting from next week. Next week is going to be a big week for us, or big Saturday for us, because that's going to be an opening service. We start at about 10.30 in the morning. We will have a shared lunch as well, so please bring vegetarian food to share. Also, there are a few people who have indicated to me they would like to be baptized uh, this is something we are working on. I'm thinking about it. And uh, you have indicated that you actually would like to make a new beginning just as we are making a new beginning by moving into a new place. Now, this is, uh, I'll have to discuss with a few of my leaders. And then definitely that is something we can look into as well. So just for everyone, please kindly do not come here next Saturday. If you do come, don't be offended if you find the doors closed because we have our doors opened in a new place. So next Saturday, we won't have Sabbath school classes. It's going to be a main service, opening service. And also at the same time, after that, we are going to have shared lunch. And anyone who is not able to make it to Aranui uh, because of transportation issues, please kindly let us know so we can organize that for you. Maybe this location was way closer to you, uh, the place where you live, and uh, you would like to now have some support and help for you to make it to Aranui, 55 Rowan Avenue. Our signage is there. We are right at the corner of Rowan Ave and Pages Road. You won't miss it. So... You can also, if you want to punch into your GPS, you can punch in 457 Pages Road, or you can also punch in 55 Rowan Avenue. It'll take you there. And it's a beautiful place. You won't miss that. Still fresh and new. But because this is going to be our last Saturday here, I was thinking, what is it that is really fitting for us to look into? Whenever I talk with my wife, sometimes, because I love talking, um, <laughs> she wants me to get to the point as quick as possible. So what's the matter? What's the sum of the matter? What's the gist of this conversation? And uh, sometimes I really want to express myself, keep on talking, but she would like to get to the point. Okay, tell us, what are you trying to tell me? So... Somewhat similarly, there is a situation going on in Matthew chapter 22, verse 40. That's the passage we are looking at. Verse, uh, actually, we will start from 34 up to verse 40. That's the passage. Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. It's, it, it comes in a context where Jesus is talking with Pharisees, Sadducees. So he's surrounded by a group of people, Herodians, and uh, then he has his disciples as well. So you've got Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and disciples. And Jesus is towards the end of his ministry on earth. You're talking about Tuesday, just before his crucifixion, which was on Friday. So on Tuesday, while Jesus is somewhere around in the temple, this conversation that is mentioned in this, pas in this passage takes place. You have... Sadducees, they're attacking Jesus. Then you have Pharisees, they're attacking Jesus. So everybody, especially Herodians, Sadducees, Pharisees, they want to get hold of this man because he's gaining a lot of popularity. He's becoming famous. They are threatened because he's gaining more and more influence and power. So while they, they have someone who, who they send who is quite educated, looks like he's a Pharisee, and he, he, he's a lawyer who seems to be well educated in, in Torah. So they send him so that he can ask Jesus this one very important question that can sum things up for anyone. 
you know, there were about 600 laws for the Pharisees. And at times for an ordinary person, it can be very confusing which laws to follow and which they can ignore or which, which aren't really important or which are very important. So, so this guy, he comes to Jesus and he asks him this question. Which is the greatest commandment? Well, they had about 600 uh, laws, and then there are some laws that were mentioned in Torah. So Pharisees, they were those people, they believed in afterlife, they believed in angels, they believed in resurrection, and they also believed in Torah. And in addition to that, they also believed in oral tradition, oral laws and practices that were handed over through gener uh, generation to generation. On the other hand, Sadducees, they were quite opposite of that. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe really in afterlife. And uh, they were more of an aristocratic uh, group of people who were always standing opposite to Pharisees. So there was always this conflict between these two groups. Herodians were more of a political group who, were, uh, who considered themselves as protectors of Herodian dynasty. So they were more of keeping the status quo, keeping the Romans in power, and trying to convince people to remain faithful and supportive in paying taxes to the Caesar. So that, that well, you are dealing with as well. The disciples were following Jesus, who are listening, and who are learning and observing and experiencing. So right in this passage, Jesus is surrounded by people. And uh, finally, Pharisees said that, well, Jesus has silenced Sadducees. We're going to send the most educated man, who is the lawyer, and he goes with him. The, the desire or intent is to, oh, when you look at the conversation, it looks like this lawyer wants to learn. He's curious, but at the same time, it looks like they're trying to tempt or test Jesus and see how much really he knows. Now, Jesus is quite well-versed, and he knew Torah. He knew God's Word. And uh, look at what's going on in this passage in chapter 22 of Matthew, verses 34 to 40. This is what it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced Sadducees, they were quite happy with that. They're, all right, Sadducees, stay away. You're silenced now. We're going to get him. So they send their lawyer. Pharisees, they send their lawyer. So they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question. What's the question? And by the way, it, it says here, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Just as uh, when I have a conversation with my, with my wife, she would like me to get to the gist of things and this guy he wants to get to the gist of things and he's asking Jesus all right we've got a lot uh, there are about 600 laws and things that people need to follow but I just want to ask you tell me which is the greatest in all those commandments which is the greatest commandment in verse 37 Jesus responds to this man and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, for the next few minutes, we're going to spend some time at understanding this. As we move to a new place, I mean, some of us, we are really looking forward to having our own place. Uh, some of us, we are really looking forward to, you know, really reaching out the, our new community. Or some of us, we just wanted to have some break from setting up and being worried about all the technical bits. Because when you have your own place, you can set things up. When you come back, you can... So there are all sorts of reasons why we are going to a new place. But what's some of the matter? Why do we as a church exist? 
What's the greatest thing that we can focus on? What's the great commandment that God calls us? Hey. Well, let's. But before we do that, I'm going to share with you. Now we, we, uh, I'm so sorry to hear actually that t -t we have Elizabeth. She's in the hospital. She had a mild heart attack. She knows Greek. She usually, when I preach and I use Greek language in my sermons, she would usually at times say, yep, that was great. But then at times she would also correct me. No, maybe you should have pronounced this word in that way. So I'm going to miss on that correction today. But it's kindly or she's in the fiddle. Greek language, the four words that are used when you translate the word love in English. The first one is toge. Toge is a Greek word which is uh, used for familial love, the love that is within a family. So whenever toge is used in the Bible, it is referring to a love, to, to love that is experienced and practiced within family. We're gonna have a, so that you can also see, is, is clicker somewhere here? Alan? Does someone have a clicker? It's here. Okay, so let's just have a look at Storge. We have, we have already looked at Storge. The second one is Eros. Eros is uh, the type of love that is experienced and practiced within, let's say, husband and wife, between two lovers. Intimate, passionate love. Then the uh, third one is Philia or Philos. Philos is a love that is experienced and practiced between friends. Uh, if you're a friend, that's the type of love you have for each other. Then finally, there's a fourth Greek word that is used in the Bible when, when you translate it into English, and that is agape, or agape says, that's the word agapao, and, and that word also means love, but that love is more of unconditional and sacrificial love that is usually rendered or, or shown towards his people. God shows that love towards his people, unconditional, sacrificial love. Now looking at the passage again, let's go back to that passage where it says, when Jesus responded to this teacher, he says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. The word love here is agapal. So when Jesus is telling this teacher that you need to love your God, he's telling that you need to love your God unconditionally, sacrificially, no strings attached. But that's a difficult one. You know, all of us, we love God, we pray to God, we obey things at times, expecting some blessings as a result of it. You know, sometimes when we pray to God, we say, all right, Lord, please heal me. It's this natural expectation that, Lord, I'm praying, and I expect to be healed. God here, through his son, Jesus, who is talking to a teacher, to a lawyer, is saying that, love your God, and the word is used, agapow, which means, love your God unconditionally. No conditions to be set. No strings to be attached. When you love your God, you just love him because he is to be loved. Not that if he gives you blessings, then only you love. Or if you get some reward, that's only when you love. Or if he blesses you financially, that's only when you give. And then he uses there are four, uh, three key words here. And the uh, first one is, uh, let me use the whiteboard here. The first one is obviously, he, he says, love your God with all your heart. And then he says, love your God with all your soul. And then he says, love your God with all your mind. Okay? So you have three things here. Love your God with all your heart. Love your God with all your soul. Love your God with all your mind. When you look into the Greek, the, like, there's a word for, for heart, it is cardia. It's a noun, 
non is used for the heart, and for the soul is psyche. Now, when it is translated as soul, actually in Greek language, this word does not mean soul. It means breath. That is the source of living. So when God is saying that love your God, uh, Jesus is saying that love your God with all your soul, his soul is not some sort of entity. Actually, Jesus is telling this man that you, when you are breathing, each of your breath comes as a result of you actually existing for God. You're loving God. As long as you're breathing, you're alive. And Jesus is telling this teacher that as long as you're breathing, this breath, that spark of life is in you, you love your God unconditionally, sacrificially. And then this word is uh, in, in, in Greek as well. It implies psychological seed of thinking and thought. In other words, whatever you think, the thinking power, the seed of all your thoughts, through that you need to love. Now here's what makes it really interesting is that when you look into Greek language, it's, it's, it's in different form, which we call dative form. The word is dative, D-A-T-I-V-E. Now dative, it can be translated in a number of ways. So here in this situation, it's a, it's a dative of means or instrument. So what do we mean by that? When Jesus is telling this lawyer that you need to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul or breath, with all your mind, he's saying that use these as the means of loving God. If you don't love God with your action, you love God with where the actions start. You love your God not just with your words, but you love your God where thoughts begin, which is your mind. You, you, mind is the means or instrument of you loving God. Heart is where your affections are. It's, it's called the seed of emotions and affections. So that you don't love God with your feelings, but love God where the feelings originate. Use that to love God. You know, many times we can be loving God just with our words, but not really loving God with our mind. There are times we could be just a little affectionate, uh, render random act of kindness towards somebody and feel good about it because, yeah, yeah, we've done something good, but not really have God in our heart. Heart is the source where affections, emotions originate from. And when Jesus is talking here, he's saying to this lawyer, use this as the means, as the instruments through which you need to love God. Now, in, in, in any grammatical or in any language, there are three components, by the way, where you have the subject who renders the action, then you have the verb that is action in itself, and then you have the object upon which the action happens. For example, uh, we have Hami here, and I throw something towards Hami, that's the action. I am the one rendering the action, and the action is rendered upon Hami. I'm throwing, the, uh, throwing stuff towards him. Here in Greek, when it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The action verb is love. And it's in a, in a grammatical form which implies action from author's perspective. When Jesus is saying to this lawyer that love your God, Jesus wants the people to love. He assumes that, that that's what people will do those people who follow him. All right, let's carry on. Jesus says, this is the first great commandment to this lawyer that, well, well, you are here to find out what's the sum of the matter. Talk about prophecy, talk about Sabbath, talk about anything and everything. But at the end of the day, my friend, here's the sum of the matter. This is the greatest commandment. 
love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I can almost imagine that this teacher or lawyer is looking at Jesus now. He's curious. He has come to test him, but now he actually has ended up learning more from him. So what happens next? Let's uh, carry on. We're going go to go to the second part of this passage. In verse 39, this is what happens. And the second is like it. Look at this word, like it. No, first one, if Jesus is saying the first one is the greatest commandment. And then Jesus goes on to this lawyer and says the first one is greatest, but the second one is also like it. It's not different than from the first one. That makes it really interesting. So what has gone before the second commandment is no different than what I'm going to tell you now. So what's the second commandment? In the second one, it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? We have looked at the word love here. And the Greek word that is used in the first commandment is agapao or agape, which refers to sacrificial, unconditional love. And in the second commandment here as well, you have the word love here. Now, that's what got me. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I would have expected that Jesus would be using philos or philia, which is more of a friendly love. Greek word, when he's talking about love here. When he's talking about loving your neighbor. When he's talking about anyone else. But Jesus makes it very interesting. He uses the same word, which is agapao. That's the same Greek word when he says, Love your neighbor is saying that if you want to love me, love me unconditionally, agape me sacrificially. But at the same time, I want to challenge you that the same love that you have for me, you're using your mind, your soul, your heart as instruments to love me. I want you to do the same when you love your neighbor is agape unconditional, no strings attached. Man, that's a tough one. How do you love someone unconditionally? Even, you know, nowadays, even if you do a little act of kindness, then there is a selfie here. Yeah, we've done something good for this person. And it goes on to the Facebook, how many views I've got. How do you love somebody unconditionally, sacrificially, just the way God loves us? God, through his son Jesus, is challenging each one of us to love your neighbor. Same Greek word. And to make it even more interesting, then it goes to next stage. And then it says, you, you shall love your neighbor as as, complete that for me, yourself. Now, siato is, is, a, is a pronoun. We call it reflexive pronoun. Now, reflexive pronouns, they, have, they do funny thing. Reflexive pronouns are there to reflect the action upon the subject. In other words, I hit myself. Okay? I love myself. So you are rendering, you are the subject of caring or the action, but you also become the object of that action. In other words, if you are loving, usually we love others, right? Love is the action that you render for someone else. But here Jesus is saying that you love your neighbor, but then he says you also love yourself. You love yourself. Can you hug yourself? Let's hug ourselves. Do you want to hug yourself? How do you love yourself? Now, it's, it's really interesting that these two commandments, when, when Jesus gives the first one, he says, like it is the second one, that 
if you love God with all your soul, heart, and mind, then you ought to also understand that, that in the same way, you also have to love your neighbor. And once you have also learned doing that, then you also need to love yourself just the same way you love God, just the same way you love your neighbor. Now, that's very interesting because I don't know how many of you love yourself. I, at times, I have really harsh conversations with my wife, harsh in a, we don't fight or insult each other, harsh conversation in a sense that I am too harsh sometimes towards myself. You know, you accomplish things, and still I say, I don't think I've done enough. It, you're too harsh to yourself sometimes. And uh, if you fail, you're too harsh. Uh, just all the time criticizing yourself that you're a failure. You have achieved nothing. Last night, I was having a ch uh, chat with my wife, and she's reading at the moment uh, one book, uh, which is called Winning War in Your Mind. Winning Wars, that's, that's the type of title. Winning War Within Your Mind. That's where the war begins. And as she was telling me, she's really enjoying reading that book. And she's telling me the story of a man who, who, who's a pastor, who, who is the author of that book, that how actually every day, even he's sitting at home, there's a war going on in his mind. And there are times when he's losing that war, and there are times when he's winning that war. And that's the war within yourself. So how one can really love themselves? Well, there are a number of things I would like to suggest to you. Well, the first one is to recognize our word in God's eyes. The moment we begin to find our worth in our achievements, is it, it's going to take you around and around, and you'll never feel that you're worthy. You are someone who is successful. Because there is always something better and bigger that you can achieve in your life. There is always someone who is better and then bigger than you. And the moment we begin to find worth in those things, we'll begin to criticize ourselves and will begin to think that we are not worthy. And Jesus, when he's talking to this lawyer, he's telling him, love your neighbor as yourself. If we don't know how to love ourselves, it's very hard to love others. If we don't know how to love others, it's very hard to love God. Now, here's something very interesting that I discovered. I call it love triangle. Okay. Some of you, you were during the conference, and, uh, and I shared that there. Now, here, you have God right here, then it's you here, and then here is your neighbor. Now, that's what is going on here, actually. Jesus is telling the lawyer that you need to learn to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In other words... All your existence has to be for God. We exist as long as our heart beats, isn't it? Amen to that? We exist as long as we breathe. You know, if there is no heart, there is no brain. You know, sometimes even people have a minor stroke. Why people fear that they may end up paralyzed or, you know, they may not be able to blink or walk or something happens because the blood flow in the brain is interrupted. So as long as this thing is working, you exist. If this stops, you stop existing. And likewise, you have breath or soul or, or heart. All of that are the centers of life. The moment they stop functioning, you stop existing. So when Jesus is saying, love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, he's simply saying, you exist to love. The moment you stop loving, your existence becomes meaningless. If you don't love God, it's meaningless.
If you don't love others, it's meaningless. If you don't even love yourself, your living is meaningless. Wow, that's huge. So here's the thing. You love your God. That's what's mentioned here. And then Jesus is saying, you love your neighbor. And then he's also saying, you love yourself. Now here's the thing. Here's a very, very interesting thing. I want you to pay attention to that. This is very important. There can be times when people, they love God, but they don't love the neighbor. There can be that times. So what happens in that case, that you are wanting to grow closer to God, but you don't want to grow closer to your neighbor. So what happens, the type of triangle comes is something like that. So you are wanting to grow close to God, but your neighbor is far away from you. It's type of uh, hypocritical type of living. Where you are playing holy holy, but you're not really living holy holy. Do we understand what I mean? So the second option I will give you is that you can be very close to your neighbor. You are here, but you're very far from God. That can happen. There are people who are very kind and loving, don't even believe in God. Okay? The third option is that here's you, here's your neighbor, and here's, uh, here's your God. You can grow closer to your neighbor, and then you can grow closer to your God. The more closer you get to God, and the more you love your neighbor, and the neighbor gets closer, the distance between you and the neighbor becomes shorter and shorter. Can you see that? If you are loving God, you are moving that way. You can't just move towards God, but you also have to move closer to your neighbor. And help your neighbor to also move closer to God. So, you go walk towards this way. Help this person as well to move, move closer to this way. So the distance here is bigger distance, but as you're navigating closer and closer to God, the distance between God is reducing. You're becoming more closer in your relationship with God. But at the same time, your distance between the neighbor is growing lesser and lesser. So Jesus here is calling not just to love God, but to love your neighbor, love yourself as well. So recognize the word that you have in God. The second one is try thinking positive. Uh, it's very natural for a person to, to become very negative. I've fallen prey of that. Uh, and it takes intentional effort to think positive. The third one is render unconditional love for yourself, for myself. Don't set like rules that if, 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 if you achieve that, only then you're going to appreciate yourself or love yourself. I can tell you at times, you, you know, people say that if you achieve this goal, then you, then you have a party, you, you, you reward yourself. I'll say, don't just do that. You can reward yourself as you go towards that, that achievement. You can love yourself as you're moving towards your goals. Don't just love when you have achieved your goal. What if you don't achieve your goal? Would you never love yourself? God is telling, enjoy your life, enjoy yourself. And finally, the fourth one is forgive yourself. If you've done something wrong, you know, the thing is that God may have already forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. You're, all, all, you're, you're the one who is killing yourself, criticizing yourself. Forgive yourself. You will love yourself as a result of that. And finally, nurture your body and soul. Look after yourself. Don't be too harsh on yourself. Take rest. Give ample time to yourself. You know, sometimes 
If your cup is empty, you can't give much to others. Finally, I'm, I have one more point I want to give you that's, that just uh, would, would nail things. In verse 40, Jesus says, on these two commandments, what, what happens? Hang, okay, on these two commandments, what happens? Hang all the law and what? So you have one, one commandment, one here and two here. And then he's saying on these two, you have law and prophets. On these two, you have law and prophets that hang. Now, just, just to make it clear, in Old Testament or during Jesus' times, the whole Old Testament was divided into two parts. The law, which was Torah, and uh, Nevim, which was the prophets. So first five books of the Bible were called law. Everything else was called prophets. So when Jesus is telling this lawyer that on these two commandments, Jesus is saying the whole Old Testament hangs upon these two commandments. Now to make it very, very interesting, here's the thing. The word that is used, hang, is a Greek word, which is keramentai, uh, which is used here. It's the same word that is used in the gospel, uh, in, in the book of Acts, where it refers to Jesus hanging upon the cross. When I discovered that, I said, wow, that is so fascinating. Before Jesus was hung up on the cross, that cross was a symbol of shame that cross was a symbol of insult the moment jesus was hung upon that cross the same symbol which was the symbol of shame became the symbol of hope the symbol of life it gained new understanding new light people begin to see cross in a different way Likewise, before Jesus was hung upon the cross, he was known as the Son of God, the Son of David. The moment he was hung upon the cross, after that, he was known as the Savior of the world. Someone who died for the world, who saved the world. When Jesus is talking about here, he's saying upon these two hangs, law and prophet, he's saying... We're not going to get rid of the law and prophets, but the moment you hang law and prophets about, upon those two commandments, you'll begin to see them in a different way. Are you with me? You will begin to see them, see them in a different light. It will get a new meaning for you. You'll become free. You are bound by 600 laws, you don't need them. You need only two. And these are love you, God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And like it, love your neighbor. And then he says, love yourself. And the moment you begin to do that, the whole Bible will become very different to you you'll begin to see it in a different way. So here's the thing I want to leave with us. As we move into a new place, are we going to look at how many seats we've got, what color we have, what curtains we have, how many pews we have? What are we moving into? Are we moving into loving God more? Are we moving into loving our neighbors more? Are we moving into loving ourselves more? Or are we moving in to criticize, to insult, to hate, and to be angry, to complain, and to become way more negative? What are we moving into? I'd like to make an appeal. Jesus said, upon these two great commandments, Hank's law, and Nevim, which is the prophets. Would you like to hold on to these two laws? I want to see your hands. You want these laws to be the driving force in your life, 
Amen to that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord. This passage is so much full of knowledge and full of understanding. And obviously through this passage, you're calling us to ultimate relationship with you and with others. And as your people have committed today to love you with all, your, all, all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, They've also committed to love the neighbors with all their heart and mind and soul. And not just that, they've also agreed to love themselves with all the mind, the soul, and the heart. And I pray, Lord, that as we make this commitment, as we begin new in a new place, may you help us to remain focused on these two great commandments. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.